But I want to give you another hard one. I think on every university campus <clears> I've <throat> ever been, this one comes up. Student from the Far East says, what about all of the religions that have come before Christianity? And if you grant that the Christian message is exclusive, isn't this vastly unfair to claim that all these people are damned to hell because they don't mm -hmm. believe in Jesus? What would you say to that? It's a good question. In uh, logic, it's called uh, the, the, the fallacy of uh, calendar or time, or however you want to put it. If that is assumed to be, therefore, the guidepost for truth, that this came before, think of all the things people have believed before, whatever we believe now, that were so fallacious. You can't really go by the calendar. Uh, what happens to Islam? Because uh, Christianity predated Islam by six centuries, you know. What happens to the Gita over against the Vedas? The Vedas came centuries before. They were monistic. The Gita is more theistic. What happens to the Vedas after that? Uh, what happens to uh, Hinduism after Buddhism comes on the scene? Or then after Buddhism comes Jainism? And then a late comer was uh, Sikhism. Do all that happen before, all that believed things before? So it's a fallacious starting point. I think what we need to also correct this idea that Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago and therefore anything that predates that would have to take precedence. Actually, 3,000 years before Jesus was Abraham, who lived by faith. We talk about the Judeo-Christian worldview. You go back 1400s before Jesus and you've got Moses giving the law and talking about uh, ultimately how the law points to a redeemer and so on. So even that is fallaciously believed that it was something new that just came 2000 years ago. The Bible says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners has spoken to us through the prophets in the last days has spoken to us through the Son. Here's the illustration I like to give, John, and my friends in India would appreciate it. It's like this. One of our servants went to see a movie for the first time, and he walked into the theater and was looking in the wrong direction. And he thought he had paid money to look at beams of light coming, in th coming out through holes in the wall until he turned to the right and looked at the screen and said, oh my word, what am I seeing? I'm seeing a face. Many religious worldviews could have been those beams coming out of the wall Ultimately, the light shines on the person and the face of Jesus Christ, in whom was the culmination and the consummation of all truth. There may be hints of truth in these other worldviews. The totality of it was in the person of Jesus Christ. So to the person listening, I just say, take the Gospel of John, start reading it, see what it says about Jesus, see his answers to your questions, and you'll find the consummate expression of truth in his person. What about the part? What about those that have lived in the past and they didn't believe in Jesus? Is it fair or unfair for them to be separated from God for eternity? However we answer that, the most important part of the answer is this, that the Bible says the judge of all the earth will do that which is right. It's interesting that that statement comes in the context of the judgment that was coming upon Sodom and Gomorrah. God is more fair than you or I. God will do that which is right. But it also tells us historically how people, what did Abraham know? He was raised in a culture of polytheism and so on, but he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. Where did he come up with that idea from? God speaks to us within our own consciences. God speaks to us in the privacy of our, own, of our own lives. And the fact is that he speaks through conscience, he speaks through creation, he speaks ultimately through his word and then in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. I want to know if uh, Jesus came to save everybody from their sins, then what about the people before him? And uh, didn't Jesus only come for the Israelites and the Jews? The, the people at the foot of Jesus' cross had no idea that he was dying for the sins of the world. What are we to think about the people who lived centuries before him? They had no idea that somebody will come and die for their sins, and, and Jesus in particular. The idea that Jesus died for our sins is an idea propounded by later teachers, especially Paul, who wrote in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, that Jesus became a curse for us. Having now adopted this idea that Jesus died for our sins, they already had to deal with the question which the sister just asked. What are we to say about the people who lived before Jesus? Well, if, if, 
then the conclusion is that, well, somehow they must have anticipated Jesus, and through their anticipation of Jesus, they will be saved. But, but this is a justification after the fact, because those people had no anticipation, really, that Jesus will come and die for the sins of the world. Uh, so, in, in short, it seems that this is uh, a, a later idea, foisted upon the uh, Old Testament, in, and it is used to reread the Old Testament scriptures in the light uh, of this uh, later developed idea. Think about this for a moment. That means from the time of Abraham until the time of the New Testament, talking about 2,000 years, or from the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai until Christianity, uh, first century, we're talking about 1,300 years, the Jews, you can see, knew nothing about a trinity. God warned the Jews throughout all these centuries, worship me in the truth. You admit that they would have no idea what that truth is. Abraham spoke to God. He didn't speak to a triunity. You believe that if you don't believe in the gospel, you don't have salvation. How is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David saved without the Trinity? Isn't it more likely, isn't it clear that the Trinity was unknown to anyone? And it's a product of a Catholic church, which I frankly am surprised that Protestants follow. The Bible says clearly that God wouldn't play a trick on us, not tell us the truth of his nature, punish us for not worshiping him properly, and then going, ha ha, I didn't really tell you, here's a Christian Bible 2,000 years later. I mean, honestly, how is Abraham saved? Why would God call him his friend if Abraham didn't worship the Trinity, uh, if Daniel is God's friend, beloved Daniel chapter 9? Okay. Why would God keep a secret yeah. from these we're, we're, great We're running out of time God? here. I mean, the question is an important one. It not only highlights and emphasizes again the relationship between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that religion which uh, is pulled together in the person of Abraham, uh, but it also uh, highlights what is possibly an anachronism to think uh, of uh, Abraham uh, somehow needing to first believe in Jesus in order to be saved. If Jesus is the only pathway to God, well then what about the prophets uh, before him? And if, furthermore, what about people who do not hear about Jesus? Or what about people who do not develop the mental capacity to make an intelligent choice about Jesus? But what about people who die in infancy? Or people who um, are, do not develop, as I said, that mental capacity? Uh, that this seems to be a difficulty. But if we take the, the view uh, that people are just basically saved anyhow until they turn away from the grace of God after having deliberately understood, uh, and deliberately turning away after having understood, well then there is no puzzle and there is no problem to be solved. Moreover, the promise that was given to Abraham is also repeated as a promise given through his son Ishmael. Uh, that uh, God will make him also a great nation. And the Kumash, a Jewish commentary on the Old Testament, uh, the, the writers in fact have made a bold statement uh, identifying the Prophet Muhammad and his teachings as the fulfillment of that promise which had been made to Abraham and his son Ishmael. And so we see that uh, Abraham, yes, he believed in God and his faith was credited to him as righteousness. But the book of James in the New Testament apparently replies to Romans and Galatians by insisting that Abraham not only believed, but he acted according to the commands of God. And Abraham did something. Not only was he willing to sacrifice his son, but he also carried out the commandment of circumcision. And that, according to the book of Genesis chapter 17, was to be a lasting commandment for all time.